Mr. Speaker, thank you. An honour to rise, truly an honour to rise as the uh, official opposition critic for education. Here, here. Might I say as well that I like to refer to it as advocate because I think it strikes a much better tone. I guess we might say that the third time is a charm where the Education Act is concerned. And why don't we start with a compliment, do something completely different. Tip our cap to the Minister of Education that was able to make this work and get this bill through. Government does work sometimes. Government does listen sometimes. And I believe there were amendments from both sides of the political spectrum, which is tremendous, even though we might not agree with the ones with the members on my left, literally. <laughs> uh, it is troubling to me that it, it, it's so hard sometimes to get to this point. And it, it seems so difficult to listen to the public when they're screaming their displeasure. But again, we did get, get there. So to, to, to understand where we are, I think in anything, it helps to know where we came from. But without going back to the beginning of, of the Education Act, I think it is, is important that we go back to Bill 2, or at least to the, to the beginning uh, of the last session, the end of the last sitting of the spring legislature, when we had so many people here voicing their displeasure, because that, that is when the rubber hit the road. That is when Albertans rose up. That is when the Wild Rose Party, led by my colleague, the member from Airdrie, the former member from Airdrie Chestermere, uh, and the member from Calgary Fish Creek, and a couple of members that are no longer with us, stood up and said, we hear you, we are listening, we'll be your voice, we will push for the amendments that Albertans want to see in the Education Act. So thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Speaker, I heard it loud and clear during the election campaign. I heard it on doorsteps, I heard it at coffee shops, I heard it in church, I heard it at the grocery store, and I would put to you that probably all of us did where the Education Act was concerned. Albertans do not want and did not want the Human Rights Act tied to the Education Act, so we asked them to change it. The Education Minister at the time, you'll recall, tried to marginalize homeschoolers seemingly suggesting it was a small group of radical thinking people with these intolerant views. Well, it didn't take long to see that it wasn't a small group at all, and homeschoolers had a very, very good point. They were supported by charter schools, they were supported by separate schools, and they were supported by many in the public system at all. But it did take a small group of people to come forward and start the ball rolling. And they were backed by a small but very mighty caucus, the Wild Rose Caucus, might I point out, and this may be one of the biggest reasons why, that caucus has since more than quadrupled in size. Here, here. Here, here. On the issue of parental rights in education, parents are the primary educators of their kids. And, and this takes nothing away from the great work that teachers do and the lifelong legacy that teachers have on their students. Let us never forget that as we talk about parents. We, we have probably all been touched in positive ways uh, in a legacy aspect from teachers and, and the mark that they have left on us. But parents have to be empowered to make the decisions they feel are right concerning their kids. You should be able to teach your kids your beliefs without a bureaucrat standing over your shoulder to make sure you are doing it their way. Thank you to the Minister once again for recognizing that where his predecessor would not recognize it. Now I went to the Minister's press conference yesterday downstairs and uh, was very impressed with how forthright he was on many of the issues that, that were raised. One thing did disappoint me though at that press conference and that is that the former Education Minister, now Deputy Premier, was not there to address many members of the media that would have mm -hmm. liked to have asked him a question. On the issue of the Human Rights Act, which I think is fair to point out, because we all remember how polarizing that debate was and all of the things that were exchanged, I had several reporters say to me yesterday, I really would like to ask that minister a question to see what is it that's changed so radically with all of these people all of a sudden, including the minister himself. How is it that they, they all lump into this, this new category where it's acceptable? On the issue uh, of human rights and education, I think we can t probably take a lead from the federal government, and in particular the member from Westlock St. Paul, Mr. Brian Storseth, who succeeded in amending the Human Rights Act and uh, rightfully pointing out that 
Freedom, such as freedom of religion or freedom of association, don't mean anything without the guarantee of expression, and that does extend to education. Now, I can support the revised provision to promote understanding and respect for others and honour and respect the common values and beliefs of Albertans, precisely because those common values do include freedom of expression and they do include freedom of religion. This will clear the way, I believe, for parents to continue to do what they do best, that is, parents and be full participants in the education of their children without fearing persecution from a human rights lawyer who has his own agenda, his or her own agenda. Now, I do have some concerns with the new Education Act, of course. I think we probably all do. It's a, it's a thick document. It'll never be perfect. I would like to make a point on a couple of them. First of all, in increasing the age of access to 21, it, it is a novel goal. We should try and get as many kids to graduate as we can. I know we'd all agree on that. My concern is the potential social problems that, that could arise when you have a 21-year-old man, a young man in a cafeteria with a 15-year-old girl, for all intents and purposes. I think schools are aware of that concern too. I know I heard it from principals. I heard it from educators in my travels this summer. I would bet the education minister did as well, and probably many of us. So it's something to keep our eye on and make sure the supports are there for schools so that they deal with these issues and, and, and they don't morph into something much more serious that we wouldn't want to see. Perhaps a, a community college class, there could be other options that we could look at. Raising the compulsory age of 17, again, the ideal is great. Let's, let's keep our kids in school, I think, as long as we can. Let's get them through grade 12. But there, there would be, I think, potential problems with enforcement of this. I'd rather see us catch students and help them before they get to the point where they do want to drop out. Again, I believe we'd all agree on that point. Yeah. And I guess to close on it, to say that improving our grad rate, I just think it's a lot more complex than, than to suggest uh, changing the age rate will we'll, we'll fix it. But, but maybe it is a good step. Raising it by a year does seem you know, a little simplistic. I hope it works. Let's monitor the level of success. On the issues of inclusion in our schools, and, and many people have spoke to it already, and I'm sure we'll hear more, I, I'm concerned that in our desire to be more inclusive, are we making the environment more difficult for the students and the teachers at times? In our desire for the greater good, we might actually be being counterproductive. There's no template or formula, I don't think, when it comes to including students with special needs in classes. I've heard it, I've heard it from several teachers, again, in my travels around the province this summer. Specific examples where, you know, you might have a classroom with three or four students below the, the reading level by a couple of years. Maybe you add a special needs student to that classroom, and then you have a couple of students with ESL, you know, that are, are struggling with the language. To try, and, to try and, you can wind up taking away from the entire group sometimes, is what I'm hearing from, from parents and from teachers. So we, we want to make sure that we give them the resources they need to make this happen. And it, I think it makes great sense also to let these things be decided locally, let teachers and principals and parents have their say. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. And, and if we travel to our own schools, I'm sure we'll hear there are many different circumstances. It's a huge bill. It is, it is hugely important to the future of our kids, which means it's hugely important to the future of Alberta. And I know we all take it seriously. I, I see the passion, hear the passion today. I heard it when I was trying to make some points to counter some points that were made over here. Uh, although I listened to those points without feeling the need to throw my points at them at the same time. Uh, again, I applaud the work of the government on this and, and the current education minister. We all had better recognize the years of work that went into it and the thousands of uh, stakeholders and parents that had, had their say to try and put this together. And once again, I'd like to also applaud the opposition and um, uh, my colleague, the member from Airdrie and uh, the member from Fish Creek, the other two members who were here, that I think led the charge in many ways to get some of this done. And uh, th there is much, much to say on the bill. I know many others want to have their say. We we're going to go through it. We're going to consult with stakeholders. And I look forward to, to more discussion. And again, thank you for the honour of, uh, of speaking on behalf of 
what I view as something very important in the province of Alberta. Oh,